Okay. Um, so uh, Alan and I are both going to share some of our experiences with deploying applications. Uh, we both happen to use build out, but um, I think there's as much value in just you know some of the things we encountered in deploying applications uh, as in the build out particular details. And in fact, I'm going to uh, I'm going to basically give a talk that I gave at PyCon last year. Um, I'm not sure that URL works, but I'll, I'll make it work if it doesn't. I, I have a feeling it doesn't work at the moment, but, um, uh, but, but I want, you know, maybe I think it would be useful to have us talk not too long and then maybe answer questions. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I, I guess since I've got some slides, I'll start, and then um, I'll try not to take more than 10 or 15 minutes. 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay. So, um, so at Zope Corporation, uh, we've dealt for years with deploying applications. Uh, in many cases, it was you know, for our customers to deploy and us to support them. Uh, and then in the last few years, we've switched to a, a hosted model. Thank you. Um, uh, in the in the, in the, when we first started this, uh, we were using Make to sort of encapsulate our applications, uh, and so we would give our customers uh, a tarball, and they would open them up and run Make, and that would build their applications. Uh, and that was that had a couple of problems. One is Make is kind of a terrible tool in a lot of ways, and also it was kind of hostile to our customers. Uh, it was a sort of a non-standard deployment. Um, so uh, I, I don't want to belabor these points. Feel free to. Uh, to ask me questions, and also feel free to yell out if I'm going too fast. I uh, apologize in advance. So I, I'm going to skim over some of these things because I really want to focus on uh, deployment. So, um, so uh, at Zoop Corporation, I don't I don't know how how you all are, but at Zoop Cor Corporation we have um, operations people, and they wear pa well they don't wear pagers anymore, but um, if something goes wrong with an application, the applications are monitored pretty aggressively, and if something goes wrong, they get woken up. And uh, it's really important that when you get woken up at two or three in the morning and you go to try to figure out what's going on, that things make sense. And so typically, in the past, when developers have deployed applications, they've been in their home directories and owned by them and startup scripts and that nobody could find and log files in strange places, and that's a real bad place to be at three o'clock in the morning unless you're the one getting woken up. So, uh, uh, so since developers don't want to be woken up at three in the morning, they, they like the operations people to, uh, we, we really need to be, be kind to them. Um, so when we install things, we try to do things in standard ways, using standard system packaging tools, and installing things in, in relatively standard places. Um, <clears throat> when, uh, so I'm gonna talk about some techniques we use and in the, in the context of that, we'll, we'll do that in the context of a sample application. And this is pretty typical, a sort of a simplified version. You might have some application servers that are running something like Django or Plone or what have you. Uh, they might share some databases, and they, t you know, they might have a load balancer in front of them, and you've got to sort of uh, deploy this entire system. Um, <clears throat> uh, so I'm going to talk about what we do to do that. Uh, the, the first step, well, typically in development, you have uh, a bunch of things that have to work together, and we have a build out that does that, and it's geared towards development, so everything is sort of self-contained. Uh, I'm not going to really go through this. I can later if people are curious about it. When we deploy software, uh, we, as I said, we, dis we deploy as RPMs. Uh, you might, if you're you know, running an Ubuntu-based system, you might use devs. Um, we follow a fairly standard procedure to do that. We create a source release. We, um, uh, we then you know, build our RPM from that. Uh, install it, and uh, we'll, we'll look at an example, or maybe we won't look at example because I don't want to take that much time right now. Uh, so we have a tool that, given a build out, can generate a source release, and the idea of the source release is that everything is self-contained. So you, you run this script against a, a build out, typically against a, 
uh, subversion URL to a build out, and what you end up with is a tarball with, with everything uh, contained. Uh, I'm going to skip over that. Um, when we generate an RPM, we have a fairly generic spec file that, uh, that we ru run through RPM build. Uh, if you're familiar with, with RPMs, this will, be this will be sort of familiar. And if you're not familiar, you don't care. So, um, But if you're interested, uh, the slides give examples of, of, of how you might do that. Um, Um, so then our philosophy is that you install software and that doesn't contain any sort of configuration. So uh, when we de deploy a database server or a CMS, we might, we might deploy that for multiple customers. And so, so our approach is to create a, an RPM that has just the software. And when you install the RPM, what you end up with is software, but you don't, you don't have anything configured. So you don't have any running processes or or anything like that, there's a separate step where you then configure that. Um, uh, and so uh, the way we do that is we have a, a tool, uh, we're going to probably be switching away from it, but it's a homegrown tool for distributing files. Uh, but then once the files are on the system, we have a script that we can run. And we, have, we use build out to uh, control the actual deployment of the running processes. Uh, and that's a, that's a build out that doesn't install or build any software. All it does is generate all the necessary configuration files and run scripts and just automates that entire process. Um, uh, so for example, uh, in this example, we're installing a, a database server, a, a Zeo server with just one database. And as you can see, we get, uh, if the customer's name is Ample, uh, then we end up with an Etsy Ample and all the, relative, all the relevant configuration files uh, and then in, in, in Etsy and ITD, we have startup scripts for the database, and this is all generated uh, from the build out, which means that we sort of have to figure out how to do this once, and then we can deploy it the same way for many customers. Um, how many people here uh, use build out? Okay. Um, one real, again, I don't want to take a lot of time because I want to have some time for discussion, but. Typically, like for our database server, we, we have a, notice we have a relatively long uh, configuration file, which, is, which kind of stinks. Uh, the reason for that is we've got a lot of things we want to do. We want to have a pack script, and uh, here we're, we're doing garbage collection as a separate operation. So there's a bunch of little details that when using generic recipes, you end up with lots of parts. And, and that's good because you can do that, and it's still relatively high level but it would be nice if you could sort of simplify that further. Um, and so we have this concept of a meta recipe. And so with a meta recipe um, is a recipe that, that actually sort of controls other recipes and allows us to have a very high level configuration that's not generic in the sense that the recipe uh, uh, basically encapsulates your specific policy. So when at Zoke Corporation, when we deploy a Zeo database server, we, dis we deploy it in a, in a fairly specific way. And so our meta the meta recipe allows us to capture that. And so it allows you to get a configuration that's much more manageable. Uh, because it, and, and the key there is that rather than trying to use build outs mechanisms for, uh, for not repeating yourself, uh, we use Python. So the idea is that you have Python recipes that are kind of generic. We then have a configuration model on, on top of that that only scales so far. And so then to scale to the next level, we use uh, meta recipes. And, and you can ask me about that if you're, if you're interested in more. Um, and uh, so uh, that helps a lot. We can sort of deploy whole applications to systems. Uh, we'd, we'd like to actually. Um, We'd, we'd, we'd actually like to take it to a next higher level, and we're really hoping that uh, Juju, previously known as Ensemble, will, uh, will help us do that. Uh, and so this, this is a, a project that we've been contemplating, and if Juju does, doesn't work out, then we'll probably pursue it. But hopefully, uh, hopefully, and hopefully Juju will work. So with that, I'll turn it over to Alan to describe some of the stuff that they're doing. All right. Hello? Hello? All right, so uh, the, the the differences 
after we sort of compared notes was uh, that Zocorp does things in a much more rigid, disciplined way, and we are a little bit more cowboyish. Um, if F11. Thank you. So we have. So we have at package.infosystems.com. Uh, we had three different. We had several customers, and they wanted to use normal operations. Uh, approaches to, to deploying software. So one of them was awesome. Anyway, if someone has internet, you can probably go to package.infoldsystems.com slash docs and you'll see some documentation that describes how you can use Plone from our, uh, our, 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 our RPM repository, a dev repository, and a Windows installer. And um, so it's, it's, it's sort of the, the the, the idea is that the person who's doing the code, the, the actual deployment, is using the tool that they're familiar with, RPM or Dev or Windows executable. I don't have it. And um, the uh, so so when so, so Jim Jim talked about that, but the actual nuances of the differences really are in our way that we've been working with was instead of using build out. We did actually build out onto a build machine and then run a recipe against that, that built out version <clears throat> and with a spec file that encapsulated more details. So what you would have in your spec file would be something like um, if slash Etsy slash customer name does not exist, create Etsy customer name. Uh, copy all the files from uh, slash op slash customer name slash Etsy star dot conf to slash Etsy slash so and so. So on the initial install, it sort of copies a bunch of configuration files into uh, the right directories, and those directories, those configuration files, are actually uh, when they when when this development profile was built. Get have uh, lots of information around where you're actually pointing your log files to and those kinds of things. So the person who is actually editing anything from from a from a uh, uh, operations point of view is just editing Etsy files that are sitting inside their Etsy directory, which is kind of really what they want, right? <clears throat> the uh, and then the spec file sort of they they are responsible for generating the spec file themselves. So they they take a spec file which is on the website. Uh, and they actually modify it themselves, and then uh, and so they kind of control that part, and they know where the software starts and where and where they where where they actually uh, uh, sort of where they where the handoff is between the developers and the um, <clears throat> and the operations guys. I think the 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 most interesting things about this are that that we, might be implicit in what we're saying is that you do not have say services like Varnish built out inside of build out, right? I mean, Varnish or LDAP servers, you use the system packages to bring these services up, right? I mean, the build out is only there for source code application. Um, so while build out works really well for development purposes to stitch all these services together, it's not a deployment mechanism un in, in, unto itself, right? That would be insanely hostile to operations guys because if there's a security bug fix inside of Apache, right, and they need to sort of uh, update their packages, you know, you are sitting there running Apache from inside a build out, there's no way they can update that. So that, that, that is only for development uh, usage, that, that sort of pattern of being able to ha have services running. Do you agree with that? More or less. Yeah, okay. So <laughs> I'm making statements here. Uh, <laughs> so so uh, I, I would say that, 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 that that's important. The other really important part is you don't really want to start the application until the operation, you don't want to implicitly start the application. And I've had customers tell me that they do want to start the application implicitly, meaning that when they update RPM or when, when they update their source code from RPM or install RPM, they want the services to just start. And while they think that's, that might be a good idea, the problem is that you don't actually have time to change the configuration. And if someone had made configuration pro changes, Right, I mean, there's there's not a, a a specific step that someone is. I've reviewed all the configuration files that I'm using for this deployment. 
all the URLs and credentials look correct, now I want to start the application. You're just sort of presuming that all the right information is there and if it's pointing to, you know, if you're on a staging box and it's pointing to production and someone starts writing to the production database, it's the, the operations guide just doesn't have that ability to intercept that. So not, not starting the application by default, I think, is, a, is an important uh, decision. Um, so uh, I guess that's pretty much it. I mean, the, an interesting way of looking at this, if you use Windows, is um, the Plone four, the 4 series Plone Windows installers that we uh, released sort of self bootstrap where there is a, when you build out Plone, it actually doesn't give you the ability to choose where you want to build Plone out. You just, it installs it in C colon backslash Plone 4.1 or 4.0 or whatever. And it, it puts everything in there and it actually kind of violates the, the starting services. It actually starts services. But uh, it's Windows, right? And it's also sort of demo demo application. So uh, so what, what it does is it actually starts it and you can look at the CFG file that was created. And there's another CFG file that is called installer.cfg. And so installer CFG is quite interesting because what you're doing is you're filling out the parameters to feed the, 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 the recipe. And there's a recipe that will bootstrap a build out with uh, inno setup. So you run build out with this installer recipe and it will just generate an executable for your build out. And it, it will set up the services and it's a kind of a very similar, it's kind of coupled uh, the same way that the RPM and dev stuff is working is that it's all in sort of the inno setup recipe or inside the, the installer.cfg. So it's quite, it's, it's, it's very, very nice for uh, an application side to just have a, a, a fairly easy way of, of uh, packaging things up and, and, and putting it into uh, production and handing it off to operations guys. Um, and, I, and I'll definitely say that after, because I, I was not at PyCon when Jim did this. I mean, Jim's ideas are, are much, much more, uh, much better. But we, we're, we're still babies in this and we're still, still growing into it. And it's just, uh, anyone can get to it, package.infoldsystems.com docs. And if you have any questions, ask and uh, send emails if you find any typos or anything that's not working. That's it. Questions? Hi. Uh, this is not a, a provocative question, okay? It's just <laughs> especially targeted for someone that's not using any particular packaging or deploying system right now. How would you compare using build-out against, for instance, using uh, a composition of fabric plus virtual wave plus pip and, and, and the like? I mean, what would be, in your opinion, the major differences and the major benefits and, and to use one or the other? I think they're. I think they should be complementary. So, um, build out provides a nice framework. F well, okay. Well, let me first point out that there's sort of two contexts. There's the software development context, and then there's the system configuration context. And um, uh, obviously, for software development, there's not much overlap with Fabric. And so, the notion that you that build out. <clears throat> helps you assemble your software both for development and for producing something like a source release or a RPM, I, there's sort of obvious value in that and that doesn't really overlap with Fabric. For us, and I think to some degree you guys, uh, you know, we also use Buildout to configure our running processes. And the advantage of using Buildout is that um, you get to leverage an ecosystem of recipes that, that sort of make your job easier. Um, but build out, of course, doesn't dr address how you actually make that happen on a system. So um, I could imagine using something like Puppet or Fabric to cause the build out to happen. Um, I think in terms of, you know, my opinion is that using something like Puppet or Fabric to actually do what build out does um, um, is I mean, it's some, to some degree, it's a matter of taste, but I, I think Buildout provides a lot more tools for doing that in a controlled way. Also, something that's really nice for deploying configurations with Buildout, and I'm, I don't think this is a feature with Fabric or Puppet, but I might be mistaken, uh, 
is that it, it takes care of, it, it also takes care of uninstalling things. So for example, if you say, I want to build out uh, a database configuration for a customer and then later say, okay, I want to get rid of that, it's, it's very easy with build out to say, okay, uninstall all that stuff. And because the recipes, build out recipes aren't just scripts, they're actually, they, they have an API that, that, that says, normally it says, you know, I'm going to tell you what files I've installed, but if they want, they can also actually provide uninstall code. So it, it makes cleaning up very nice, it sort of handles, you know, a, a more complete do you want to add anything to that? Uh, right. So, so for for so I don't know any operations guys that would that would feel comfortable. So the operations guys that we deal with tend to to want to control and to like I, I, they don't know fabric, right? So. Um, so that's kind of the, it's kind of like a dead issue, right? Like I just can't talk the operations guys into using Fabric. And that's just, you know, that just probably kind of just ends the conversation there. But you can probably talk them into using something like Puppet or VCFG2 or... Yeah, they, they do, they, they, they do use that, yeah. right? But they use it in, with the context of the RPMs that yeah. we're generating. Not, not using a, a tool to push, it's not like a Capistrano replacement where they're like pushing stuff and configuring stuff um, from their console, right? I mean, they're not, they're not doing that. What they're doing is, I mean, there's a fairly tight controlled workflow of, of how these things are, are getting staged and validated and then they get pushed into production. It's, it, it happens with, and, and it may happen with multiple machines at simultaneously. And that machining, how it happens is not, you know, these customers aren't totally automated where, you know, you have to kind of take things out of a load balancing pool. You put things, you know, you, you're updating code, and then you, it's it's a complicated dance. I mean, it's I don't think I mean you you might be able to solve this with Fabric. I mean, Juju seems like it's got a pretty decent idea about yeah. how it could solve that kind of problem, but I don't know if Fabric would solve that for our customers. We um, we, we we were we're really interested in managing. Um, entire applications rather than, you know, so an, for us an application or a product might be a CMS and the CMS, you know, there's a load balancer, there's, there might be Apache, there might be application servers, more load balancers, there's a lot of components and we'd like to manage the application or the product as a whole. And um, I don't think any of these tools like Puppet or BCFG2 or Fabric, et cetera, I don't think any of them really address that. You know, they, 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 they help you they help you place files on individual machines and they help you manage machines, but they don't help you manage whole services, which for us is the next step that, that we've been contemplating a design, but we're hoping that, I'm hoping that Juju will take care of that. Did that answer your question? I mean, sure. Any other questions? Um, I, I'd just like to emphasize a couple points. Uh, Again, um, it's really important, unless, you know, it, it, if you have an operations staff, it's really important to take care of them. Uh, it's really important to do things, you know, to accommodate their, their workflow uh, rather than fighting it. And uh, I'd also like to point out that, or sort of as a reminder, because I sort of, I, I, I didn't really discuss it in the slides. Uh, I mean, I discussed it in the slides, but I didn't discuss it when I was going over it. Uh, there are a number of recipes that really help with this that we wrote. Um, so there's a ZC recipe deployment that is very much about putting things in the right places and recipes that work in conjunction with that. And so there's a, there, there's a lot of help to help you um, work with the operations staff. Those are uh, Linux or Unix-like uh, operating system dependent. Um, but there is a large ecosystem of, of recipes that can really get you pretty far along the way. And so looking at examples like the ones in my slides or other examples you might find, or you know, there's a lot there to help you. And also this, I mean, it's, it's not like this stuff makes any sense if you have two developers that are developing one application and they have it all in their head and they're just trying to go as fast as they can. I mean, they don't, you don't, I, I mean, I would, I would, I would, I would argue that you just don't need it at that point, right? Everything fits in one of one of the two guys' head. There's no operations guy. There's not a team, right? 
uh, and you just you, it's it's just it's just not useful for them. It's it's extra discipline that you know when you're small you don't actually need. Um, but when you, it, the, the the issue is that when you when you move to actually having the more uh, more roles inside of the project, that you don't try to force them into using things that that were that 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 is appropriate that's not appropriate for their role, right? Like I mean, forcing people to use forcing a, a systems uh, administrator who's not just administrating this one application, it's administrating a lot of applications to force him to use a technology that he only is using on your project is he will not like it and he won't like you and he's going to ev eventually make your life very difficult at some point. So it's better just to work with them in the beginning and, and make everyone happy. Any more questions? Okay, thanks. Thank you.